today on the Lowdown, a Down Syndrome podcast, Adele Perham gives us a lowdown on going back to school in the time of COVID-19. Over to you, Marla and Hannah. Thanks, Danielle. You are listening to Marla, a co-host of the Lowdown podcast and an SLP here at the DSRF in Burnaby. With me here today is my co-host, Hina, who's the senior OT at our center. It's getting time to be back to school, and this year brings more jitters than most because we're still living in pandemic times, as though anybody could forget that. (laughs) And depending on where you live, your child's return to school may look significantly different, much the same, or maybe they're not even going. Um, So this year, more than any other, is really anxiety fraught. At the time of this recording, which is early September, I can't even qualify that statement with a silver lining yet because we haven't done it. But hopefully today's guests will help you buckle in for the roller coaster that is to come. Yeah, so today we are walking through the back to school process with our guest Adele Purdom. Adele is a writer, former teacher, speaker and advocate for individuals with Down syndrome and lives in Ontario. Her memoir, Here We Are, Happy, which is pending publication, is the story of receiving a prenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome with her middle daughter, Elise. Adele is completing her Master of Fine Arts in Creative Nonfiction Writing through the University of King's College at Dalhousie, and working on her next book titled, I Don't Do Disability and Other Lies I've Told Myself. Hi, Adele, and welcome to the Lowdown Podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. What a pleasure. Yes, it's great to have you here. Absolutely. We're very excited to have you as well. Um, So in our grand tradition of the Lowdown podcast, we start our interview by asking our guest five secret questions. Um, They're not any, people panic when we say that. So they're really fun little (laughs) icebreakers. So our audience and us as well can get to know you a little bit better. Are you up for it? I'm up for it. Great. All right. So let's start with question number one. How do you feel about back to school supply shopping? (laughs) Oh, I am not much of a shopper, really, to begin with. Um, So I just want to get it out of the way as quickly as possible. (laughs) Yeah, that's fair. They love it. They like, you know, the the new crayon box smell and all of that. And some people are Uh hot. Yeah. I, I don't go back to school and I still like get excited when I see all the stores filled with, with crayons and markers and I'm not gonna lie I might have picked up some glitter highlighters yesterday just because. Um, okay so question number two Adele what are you currently reading? Oh let me think so I just finished an Annie Dillard book mm-hmm. um, I'm trying to think of the name of it I'm, I'm always listening to something and reading a couple books at a time. And right now, a lot of my reading has to do with my with my project. Mm-hmm. Um, recently, I've read Thin Places by Jordan Kistner, Make It Scream, Make It Burn by Leslie Jameson. Those are some wonderful essay collections. So I'm sort of in the realm of essay collections right now. I love to listen to audiobooks. Yeah. I listen to them on my runs when I'm doing the dishes. I sort of listen to books or read books like other people watch TV. <laughs> mm-hmm. Got it. <laughs> binge reading or binge listening, I guess, right? <laughs> Absolutely. That's awesome. Okay, question number three. What is your favorite morning drink? Oh, I love a green monster smoothie. Oh. So, <laughs> so now tell I have to tell what? you what it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's got a banana, mm-hmm. almond milk, kale, mm-hmm. chia seeds, um vanilla and cinnamon and ice cubes that's it oh so oh wait yes. and almond butter and almond butter oh there we go so it's like yeah. an all-in-one it's like a meal right um, to start to it. start the day yes exactly <laughs> i love it that's a great idea all right uh, yeah, question uh, number four do you have a first day of school ritual that you like to share with the kids you go for the cute picture we go for the cute picture on the front step of our house oh. for sure Um, and just (laughs) trying to avoid tears. (laughs) There's, you know, and it's always surprising who is the one crying. Is it me? Is it my oldest? You know, it's never the, it's never the kid that you think it's going to be out of my three daughters. So my youngest is starting kindergarten this year. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes Mm -hmm. to be kids in school. (laughs) I packed my kid off to daycare this week for the first time and I was trying to get the cute picture. And he was not having it. 
he couldn't lift his backpack so he's like all the pictures that I did get are just him making like the grumpiest face or whining or I was like okay well that's not gonna happen <laughs> it is what it is um question number five if you could be an animal what would you be Ooh. well we've been staying at this cottage in the summer and I am I'm intrigued by so much of the natural life here maybe the loons when I watched mm -hmm. the loons on the water, the way they can mm -hmm. dive down, I was standing at the end of our dock and one literally, I was like, what was that? It torpedoed right in front of me. And they're just <laughs> the most majestic creatures. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I like the, I love the water. Too. Yeah. Oh, I'm the sound impressed. and yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they swim just so, so far. They dive under and you're like, oh, it'll pop back up right there. And then no, it's like 50 meters away. I'm always impressed by them. Um, <laughs> let's let's dive in here let's talk about back to school and our sort of topic of the day first could you tell us a little bit about you i understand you're a former teacher and of course you're a parent so you've got a pretty unique lens on the back to school process yeah so i used i taught for about three years total i used to teach grade one french immersion and then sort of went into the the sphere of having babies and just making that decision to be home with my kids until they were in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the process was writing more and then sort of fell, really fell in love with writing. And now, now my career has sort of taken that direction, mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so when you think about back to school, how do you like to prepare your daughters let's talk about all your daughters and then let's talk about whether you do anything particularly different for Elise sure so usually every year before back to school be because my kids are still younger we'll do a walk all together we were within walking distance from our school so I would really recommend that for any family just even just visiting the school and going for a play on the playground um, assuming it's open, it just sort of gets the kids really ready. Okay, this is the place I'm going to be coming to, feeling comfortable. This is our walk. Remember, we do this every morning. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it helps every child, right? Just to sort of wrap their head around, okay, we're going back. And just sort of having conversations and bringing it up. And um, I'm a big proponent of literacy. So bringing in some books that are about back to school I think, I can't remember the name of it, maybe Hedgehog Goes to School or Curious George or find some of their favorite characters and there's sure to be a back to school book yeah. that you can tie in. Mm -hmm. And do you like to do, because I know some families will try and get into the school and do a bit of a drive run and take a little sort of mini tour almost. Say, okay, this is where your classroom's going to be. I know families of other kids that have Down syndrome try and go for that. Is that something that you also do? 100%. So every year, my, my daughter, Elise, who has Down syndrome, is in going into grade three this year. And it's especially important the first time in kindergarten. But I would argue it's important every single year because they're going to have a new teacher and a new classroom. And so um, our school was wonderful this year. They were proactive. They reached out to all the families in the school whose children might benefit from you know, coming in and meeting the teacher and then, you know, they sort of identified those kids who would feel more comfortable and especially with new protocols mm -hmm. with wearing masks. Mm -hmm. So what we weren't able to go because we're away. Mm -hmm. So I said, how about a virtual meetup? And sure. um, they were great. So we did a nice virtual tour of the school and her new classroom and had a nice meeting with the teacher. So I, that's sort of the second part of it, mm -hmm. right? If you can also definitely meet with the teacher. Rarely are we able to meet with my daughter's educational assistant. And I know that's going to go by a different name and different boards. Um, sometimes those decisions are made, the person that maybe will work one-on-one -on -one with your child, that's often made closer to. So, but I always say, just please keep me in the loop. You mm -hmm. know, as soon as these decisions have been made, please let us know. Mm -hmm. I always, I, I think it's so important to really know all of the adults that are involved in your child's schooling. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, 
I as, really everybody like the janitor you want to know everyone so that if anyone definitely sort of runs into your kid in the hallway and your child's looking confused they know who that child is and how mm-hmm. they could help them yeah it's, mm-hmm. sure yeah absolutely sometimes and Hina will back me up on this I like to see like if you get to go to do the inside tour of a school and you have your phone you can take some pictures and then make yourself up a fancy little social story of Mm -hmm. you know this is my spot to hang up my coat and this is my classroom door and this is my teacher so I know a lot of our students like to review that kind of thing too multiple times before actually going to school and then they can kind of ask Mm -hmm. questions about it that's really cool. It's nice yeah, that taking, schools are willing to do it too. Mm-hmm. And then taking a picture, I actually recommended to one of my um, kiddos' parents that if uh, you can even just take an iPad and make a little movie, so just like a walking tour, because then oh, yeah, sometimes, yeah. you know, it's just like you kind of get a better perspective when you can kind of see a moving sure. image for some of our kids. So yeah, definitely. I think anything you can do like that to prep ahead of time is a great idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and we, we definitely um, do that. You know, you ask mm-hmm. and say, hey, can I take some pictures? The school mm-hmm. generally say, absolutely. Um, and I know the school had done that for my daughter when she was learning, uh, kind of in reverse for social studies, when they were learning about the people in their community. Mm-hmm. They had gone around and they had taken pictures from our actual community to have a social storybook for mm-hmm. for Elise. Yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, and, really and we know that kids with Down syndrome and most of us, are primarily visual learners, mm-hmm. right? So definitely incorporating real pictures is a great idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely just, more meaningful for them, yeah. Yeah. So are you going to do anything differently this year? I mean, there's protocols up to our ears. I don't know what is happening in Ontario particularly, but here there's a lot and there's sort of daily health checks and the question of masks is being thrown around and which ages and all of that kind of stuff. So. How are you trying to prep your kids for this year? Okay, so I think this is two part. I think we need to prepare our kids, but we also need to prepare ourselves as parents. Mm -hmm. That's the big thing. So in our area, it even depends board to board in Ontario. Um, The government, I believe, has mandated masks for grade four and up, but our board has decided that children grade one and up will wear masks. Mm -hmm. So that includes my daughter, Elise, who has Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, she, we've been practicing a little bit this summer, Mm -hmm. trying on our masks. Um, Our plan is to have two masks per day so that we can make sure they're clean um, for each of our kids and probably even our daughter in kindergarten. I mm-hmm. think she's if she's willing to do it, then we'll give her that as well. The school wasn't even really clear yet on whether the kids will be wearing masks um, during recess or not, or if they'll be allowed to take them off. Mm-hmm. Sounds like they'll be able to take them off. Um, the challenge is just managing the equipment, right? Mm-hmm. For for all kids, but especially I think you know for for kids with Down syndrome. Um, so I think. But what is okay, but what is a strength is that Elise is an excellent imitator, right? Mm-hmm. So I said the the teachers they were asking me, are we concerned? And we said, you know what? If all the other kids are doing it and you have set routines, okay, mm-hmm. we line up here, we go to the bathroom at this time, we're wearing our we're all wearing our masks. Mm-hmm. I think that's gonna be a real I think that could be very helpful to a lot of kids with Down syndrome because it's where routines are a real strength and yeah. and for most kids right mm-hmm. um so i'm thinking the at school part with its routines could go smoothly but if something happens if there's illness if there's covid th- there then we have to be prepared for the scenario that the kids are coming home yeah. so what we are personally doing um we are going to make use of some some money that's available bursary money in our area um, for technology. And we're planning to buy our children Chromebooks so that they have access. So, you know, in the event that they do need to move back to virtual learning, mm-hmm. we're, we're prepared. Mm-hmm. So we're sort of being proactive that way and also having those conversations with your partner. So <laughs> my husband and I have had very many interesting conversations about, you know, who's, who's in charge of the kids schooling. You know, yeah, and yeah, yeah. then who's 
who's when who's working when because i'm i'm basically a full-time student he's working full-time mm-hmm. so these these challenges and stresses are real on parents oh, and to make sure that your kids are going to be looked after i think you really have to make sure that you're looked after mm-hmm. and that you know how you're still going to be able to meet your needs if the kids schooling is happening at home mm-hmm. I was just going to ask you that too. If you're keeping sort of an A slash B slash C plan ready. So, you know, if one of my kids is out of school, we're going to do this. And if everybody's out of school, we're going to do that. Are you working? Are you planning sort of at that level? Just to see? Yes. 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 I think so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah definitely. You know, just and I, know. but I think it's, it's one day at a time, yeah. you know, the hope is that everyone's able to stay healthy. And I know so, you know, uh, socially, emotionally from, from my kids, um, being in school is sort of what they need right now and what mm-hmm. they want and what feels right for our family. That's mm-hmm. going to be different for every family. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was definitely a challenge when things were unexpected in April, even though I, I, I'm a teacher, um, Having a three-year-old, a seven-year-old with Down syndrome, and a nine-year-old home, they are at three different levels doing three different programs, and it's a real, that was a real challenge, you yeah, know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Balancing it all, for sure. I just wanted to quickly go back to your thing about masks, because Marlon, I've talked mm-hmm. about this a little bit, and I've actually been very pleasantly surprised with a lot, a lot of our kiddos are actually starting to embrace the masks because I think it is something that's going to be a reality for a little while. So I know that a lot of parents that I've talked to will say, no, 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 he or she won't ever wear a mask. And I'm like, I totally get that, but we have to start working on them getting used to wearing a mask because it is going to hinder their participation in school. And I don't want this one thing as to be as an excuse like oh they can't come to class because you know they're not wearing a mask so Mm -hmm. there's definitely and it's so great that you're practicing with Elise already and uh, you hit the nail on the head when you said that our kids are really strong at imitating and I think because you know a lot of them are seeing mom and dad and people around in the community wearing masks it's kind of taken that you know the negative aspect of it away a little bit and you know masks are all like fun characters on them or whatever. So just for the parents listening out there, I just kind of want them to not give up on that because I just don't want that one thing to be the reason why your kid can't participate and be independent in their schooling. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah. I think it, for me, that almost goes into a bigger question of expectations. Mm -hmm. So anytime you expect more of your child or you think, well, first of all, if you think they can't do it, then they won't. Yeah. And that's true in any area for ki- for kids with Down syndrome. Mm-hmm. You know, when my daughter um, was going into grade one and we, I wanted her to be able to learn a second language, my expectation was that she would learn it. And she did, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I think, yeah, so I think with masks, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. If you think they're not going to be able to do it, then it's going to make it a lot harder for the child. But, but that's not to say that um, sensory sensitivities and those issues yeah. are not real. Absolutely. And, for, yeah. and definitely in different, um, different populations in the disability community, um, mm-hmm. not being able to lip read. Um, mm-hmm. I know that actually my daughter's teacher mentioned to me that she's partially deaf and that not being able to see her colleagues' mouths and the kids' mouths is going to be a real challenge for her, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we need to be sensitive to everybody's, everyone's sensitivities. Um, But understanding that the majority of kids, even as young as kindergarten, they can do it for sure. Yeah. And I think there's really been like a cultural shift almost. You can see lots of little kids out there who don't run right up to people anymore because they Mm -hmm. know that you're supposed to stay a little further apart. It's a bit sad, mind you, but it that's what I've noticed and little kids wearing masks and all kinds of things. It's just because that's what everyone around them is doing. I would like to add that for anybody listening, there is such a thing as a window mask, which has a clear section sort of where your mouth is. Um, It's usually plastic and it's wipeable, cleanable, et cetera. And if your child relies partially on lip reading to understand what people are saying, maybe buy a couple of those for your classroom teachers so that they have them 
Mm-hmm. And your, your child will not be the only one benefiting from that, I can assure you, because it is so muffled when you try and talk in a mask and you have to talk quite loudly. But being able to see the lips and mouth of the student is super helpful. So look for window masks mm-hmm. that I would recommend for that. And that reminds me of sort of, you know, that we're, we're a team with the mm-hmm. school, right? And so if you can do something as the parent to make mm-hmm. things better for your child's teacher, and yeah. I think I said that over and over in our interview that we had the other day, mm-hmm. you know, in our meeting, if there's anything I can do to help, I know how challenging this mm-hmm. is for teachers right now. Mm-hmm. Teachers are being told that they're not supposed to be doing um, paper and pencil activities or to l- sort of limit. But meanwhile, students also have to stay at their desks and they're not able to use manipulatives. And so I think there's so many challenge well because they need to then clean it right and Mm -hmm. sanitize everything and Mm -hmm. libraries are closed so you know I was asking is my daughter going to have books because that's something she absolutely loves Mm -hmm. and that's something that she does you know as part of her time at school so there's there's so many challenges that the teachers are facing Mm -hmm. in terms from their end in addition to the challenges we're all facing as parents yeah um we have to give to each other and help each other and support each other in whatever ways we can. Right. So the mask idea, that's a great one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's a hard year to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I mean, there's a lot of expectations on you from sort of all angles and never mind the fact that you, depending on how you used to teach before, you might have to do just about everything differently than you're used to. Yeah. It's very kind of just reconceptualizing what school looks like it's not going to be the traditional model anymore and that's overwhelming for sure like to just you know rethink everything with all these things in place so um and actually what you just said Adele leads perfectly into our next question which was how do you prepare the school um to get things off on the right foot like what are some of the things so the collaboration piece is super important so can you talk a little bit about that absolutely so I think that initial that initial meeting is so important mm-hmm. because you're going to sort of set the tone for the school year ahead and it it gives the teacher a chance so i always give the teacher a chance to ask me questions you know try to figure out what like, what do you know about down syndrome mm-hmm. without actually asking them right out but just sort of gauging their comfort level and um i'll offer supports i'll say you know um CDSS's resource guide for teachers gives great strategies. I'll just mention that in passing. Mm-hmm. Um, something else I do during that time to sort of set the, set the tone for the year is definitely talk a lot about Elise and sort of mm-hmm. where she's at, you know, and actually it didn't, it's funny, it didn't come up yesterday, but I like to have a goal in mind for the year. So she's, you know, she's into the school system now. She isn't in kindergarten. It's a little bit different in the beginning. But now that she's going in grade three, it's like, okay, my goal for this year might be I really want to solidify her reading skills. So if I keep that to myself, you know, the teacher's going to have no idea. So I like to give them a real idea about where Elise is at, what our expectations would be for her, um, any safety concerns, those definitely need to come out. Mm-hmm. Any medical issues, um, even things such as, you know, we recently took her in to get her glasses checked, her eyes are good to go. Let the teacher know about those things. Mm-hmm. It also gives them a sense of what your home life is like, that you're, you know, you've got these appointments to go to. And if they're missing school for things like a cardiology appointment or something like that, you want the teacher to sort of understand those things and Mm -hmm. and know you have that going on so I always run through sort of those things and then you know maybe some areas where we're having some challenging behavior I might you know bring up that for example Elise is a bit of a class clown so if the other kids are if she's taking her mask off and the kids think that's hilarious that maybe you know definitely we'll have a conversation with Elise but it's going to be even more important to have a conversation with the other students who Mm -hmm. think that that's funny and teaching them as well, you know, don't, you know, don't egg her on or whatever. So I'll have conversations like that. Um, And then always, 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 I will focus on her positives. Mm -hmm. I will say, you know, you are so lucky because Elise is so funny or I'll, I'll say some of the things that, you know, anecdotes from things that she's done lately. 
I really, I really want her teachers to see like, this is at least the person, you know, mm-hmm. this is who you have coming into your class and, oh, yeah. you know, you're going to have a great year and we're here to support you. And, and also, you know, here's a little bit about what our family's about and our values and um, our involvement in the Down syndrome community. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, not everyone's gonna be a volunteer on their local board, but just saying things like, you know, we love to celebrate World Down Syndrome Day. And wouldn't it be cool if the school could do something? So um, in our area, we have a wonderful uh, contest for World Down Syndrome Day, where we get all the schools involved and um, this, you know, they put in an entry of how their school celebrated. So obviously I wanted our school to be on board with doing yeah. that, right? Yeah, for sure. So, and just saying, you know, like, hey, these are the cool things going on in the Down syndrome community in our area. If the school is interested or if the class or maybe even, you know, they, the teacher would feel comfortable having you or someone you know come in and read a story about Down syndrome. So Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be something huge, but definitely bringing in that aspect as well. Yeah. Into the meeting. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because I absolutely recommend some kind of book for the class or video for the class. Um, There's a few things that you can do. I've seen it where families will write a book about their child or like Mm -hmm. a one or two pager. This is what I did during the summer. This is what I like sort of highlighting the common interests that the child has with the rest of the class so that we're seeing, okay, this person in my class is really not that different. I also love cats and monkey bars or whatever, you know, all of those similarities. And it gives a jumping off point for the classroom teacher. If any questions come up, et cetera, Mm -hmm. um, at the DSRF, we actually made a video if anybody wants to access it that is Great. sort of a what is down syndrome video that's intended for little kids like actually the grade threes that you know talks about how down syndrome is not a sickness you're not going to get sick if you hang out with another kid with down syndrome and you know what makes us the same is way more important than what makes us different that's available i think on youtube and on our website but if you wanted to present that to the school if you're not comfortable going in yourself and talking about it, say, that's also a nice way to do it. It works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we also have a video like created by some of our SLPs um, that is helping educators understand how to communicate and work with kids with Down syndrome in a classroom setting too. So yeah. there's definitely lots of resources out there, but I love it when parents go in and talk about it because you bring a different perspective. And of course, that's you know your kiddo best. So I think it's, and I know that Marla and I and our colleagues at DSRF have been asked to come in and present about, you know, Down syndrome, whether it's about our specific kiddo or just about, you know, inclusion in the classroom setting. So there's definitely lots of opportunities out there. Um, But in your conversations, Adele, like what are some of, and then I guess maybe speaking from your experience as a teacher, what are some of the common concerns or questions that you might get from teachers or SCAs? Like, what are they worried about? I would say the teachers in our, that I've had, it's more common that they don't ask anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> Which to me, then that tells me maybe, you know, because yeah. it depends how you go in as the parent. So mm-hmm. uh, they know that I'm an advocate in the community. And I think maybe that can be intimidating sometimes, perhaps. So I'm really just going in to say, hey, I'm an ally. I want to give you all the information possible. Mm-hmm. Um, But if you ask questions as the parent, then you can sort of find out what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of figure out the things, you know, just tell educating just some of the basics about, about down syndrome. Right. But I tend to, you know, later, later the questions come. So they don't usually come in the introductory meeting. Yeah. Um, A little bit later. Um, I might get asked about, I'm trying to think specific behaviors that Elise is doing. Mm -hmm. but you're going to just, you're just going to be a, you know, you're going to be a really careful listener Mm -hmm. as the parent. And if you ever hear something that doesn't sound quite right. So for me, one time it was about, it was around group work. And I was able to sort of ascertain that while Elise is included in the classroom, that she wasn't really doing the group work Mm -hmm. with her, her peers. And I had to kind of say, whoa, whoa, whoa. (laughs) you know, what, what's going on here? And 
of course she can do group work. She's not doing the same level necessarily mm-hmm. or the exact same work. But um, let's see if we can brainstorm some ways together that you could do the same work, like, or, you know, same topic, yeah. same topic, but that all the kids can be doing something together at their own level. Yeah. And when I think of that sort of thinking, I think of Shelley Moore and her, the way, you know, universal, universal teaching and universal de- yeah. design. Yeah. Um, so that can be hard for teachers mm-hmm. sometimes and for, for all of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think nobody wants to admit that they don't know. Right. And nobody wants yeah. to admit that they're potentially overwhelmed and unsure. Yeah. And nobody wants to make assumptions that are hurtful either. So, you know, sometimes teachers don't know what questions to ask because they don't want to offend a parent, even if they don't know. And they're mm-hmm. kind of overwhelmed. So they're like, okay, I'll just see how it goes. Yeah. And then, and then ask questions later. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, are there any things that you've, that you would recommend that parents, should avoid? I mean, like, what are, have you learned any lessons or anything that you feel like maybe you shouldn't go in into your conversations with teachers and SEAs and kind of avoid doing? I think that if anyone feels like they're being accused of something mm-hmm. or told they're not doing something, then immediately they're going to get their defenses up. So I think there's a way of asking a question instead of making a statement. So mm-hmm. For example, in the instance of group work, I didn't come in and say, why isn't she doing group work (laughs) with her peers? Even though you might be feeling like that, like what the heck? Exactly, right? (laughs) So maybe as, you know, take some time (laughs) to take a deep breath. If you hear something or you're feeling a certain way, figure out why you're feeling that way and then figure out how to approach it, you know, maybe even so I'd ask the question. So I just asked is Elise doing group work with her peers because yeah. they're not, they're not going to lie to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have spies. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, I mean, it's a team of people too. So you are part of that team as the, as the parents. So you want to keep the communication as positive as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, really you don't want to give them absolutely. And you don't want to give, any reason why you would not be included or you would be kept out of decisions that are impacting your child. So just, yeah, always being open and Mm -hmm. keeping that communication positive is really important. So yeah. So don't do the opposite of that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Even if you feel upset, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of goes back to when you were describing yourself as an ally too, right? I mean, the goal is at the end of the day that Elise is well supported and can flourish and, you know, Mm -hmm. so at the end of the day, we kind of have to put our own feelings aside and really figure out how we could solve the problem rather than place blame sometimes, even though you might feel like that. So as a parent, I can imagine that that would be tricky. Mm -hmm. Um, And then also like the relationship between, you know, Elise and her EA. Uh, I know that sometimes EAs can stay the same for a few years or sometimes they'll change. Um, How have you handled it when things haven't gone according to plan between Elise and her supporter at school? Okay, so we have been so fortunate with the supporters that we've had. But I'm going to tell you just to back it up a second. So Mm -hmm. that the way that we ended up in that scenario was doing a little bit of researches, research, sorry, research on the schools beforehand. Hmm. So I would just, I would just like to share a little story. So first of all, I was a French immersion teacher. And so I thought when I have children, I would love for my children to be able to learn French the way that I did. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, talk grade one, one French immersion and the kids were coming into the program and parents would always say to me, you know, I don't know, is this for my child? And I would always say, this, this program is for every child. You know, every child deserves to learn a second language, um, except for maybe if you have a language delay. <laughs> and then I had a child born with Down syndrome who has a language delay. And I said, well, forget that. <laughs> I'm, you know, we're, we're going to try this anyway. Yeah. And so when I was sort of looking at schools and our options in our area, there was one school Um, one option where I went in and I spoke to them and I said, you know, what supports would be available for a child, a child with down syndrome. 
And they said, oh, that's a really good question. (laughs) So right away, I was feeling like they have not thought about this. There has not been another child with Down syndrome who's gone through this this French program. I don't feel very comfortable here, you know, and like, so then I went to the, the school where she is now and I asked the same question and they had a student with Down syndrome in the school and they said, oh, she'll get 100% support. So I went into school and I mean, you're, you're going to be limited by where you live and what your options are. But if you can, if your child is preschool right now, really explore your options mm-hmm. and think about what's going to be the best fit for your child based on, you know, I know that I can support her in a French language program. So that is a baby better fit for our family. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But that being said, I still think a language program is for any child, (laughs) but um, yeah. And then once you get there, once you're there and you have the support, then there's sort of building that relationship and that takes time and trust. And Mm -hmm. I think, um, one thing I've asked for in the past, especially in the kindergarten years, was sort of a daily quick journal. So here's a notebook I'm sending in. Elise isn't going to tell me about her day. So if you could please send me a little note about anything of concern or any anything that sort of came up in the day or, or even just something she did, though, because mm-hmm. I know the same way you don't want to bombard a school with negativity, you don't want a school to be constantly telling you their concerns about your child. Exactly. It needs to be positive in both going both ways. Mm-hmm. But you also want to hear about if there's struggles, right? We all have challenges. So mm-hmm. it's fair to hear those things as well. So um, yeah, that that's a really great way to open the lines of communication with your support person and build a good relationship. Um, in terms of if it isn't going well, then the good thing is that it's, there's a team. So you can work with, you know, maybe working with the teacher a bit more or working with, there's going to be some other support person in the school that's going to also, um, you know, in our board, special education resource teacher, it's the, um, that position's called, that person is also there to support your child. Mm-hmm. So if, you know, if it's not working so well with one person, then maybe you can rely a little bit more on the other educators in the team. Yeah, that's great. And I think it, it is, I think thinking of it from a collaborative perspective. So not only Elisa's school team, but like if she is seeing, you know, OT or SLP or any uh, anyone else outside the school. So I think I find mm-hmm. so valuable, Marla and I, when we are able to go to the school, observe, we're always open communication with the teachers, SCAs, because we have a very similar approach to we're like, you know, we don't want to bombard you with like all these resources. We kind of want to provide you with what you need at that time. And that can help you do your job and support you and ultimately help support the, our, our, our kids in school. So, mm-hmm. And hopefully just make the day smoother for everybody, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. nobody wants to have a whole school day of contention between the child and the EA or whatever, just things not going well. Yeah. So hopefully we can just make it, make it work for, for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we're, we're almost like at the end of our interview, Joe, but I just, I was curious how you're, um, cause we're living in COVID times and I was just wondering from a parent's perspective, how you're explaining what's going on and to Elise and to your other daughters as well. But because it is something that's, it's scary, but it's going to be with us for a little bit. So how are you explaining or kind of, getting her used to her new normal for now? That's a great question. I would say, to be honest, that we, I don't want to say we've sheltered our children a little bit, but perhaps we have. We've been away for the summer. And so our normal has been just sort of our family in this bubble. Mm -hmm. But I think we try to be very open about, I would say I am pretty open with my emotions. So when I'm feeling frustrated about, you know, haven't had a lot of space because everyone's here and it's difficult to work, we talk about those things. Mm -hmm. Um, And so things, we talk about it peripherally. We don't necessarily focus too much on it and not, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to project any of my anxieties onto my kids. I'm Mm -hmm. sort of aware of that. They don't really need to 
to carry that or they, they need to know about what's going on. They mm-hmm. need to understand, but in a way that's kid appropriate. So yeah. we've watched a couple of videos. There's been, there was a really nice one put out through their French board, just really short directed for kids um, mm-hmm. that they watched. But I really think <laughs> it's, it's a little bit, honestly, over Elisa's head, you know, when yeah, we talk yeah. about it. She's like, back to school. You know, we had the meeting with her teacher. I, I really want to keep that as positive as possible, oh, right? Yeah, She's sure. excited. Absolutely. So yeah. it was, you know, back to school. She got her glasses on. She put her backpack on that we got her. And That's out awesome. the door she went. And we're like, <laughs> it's not today. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> but uh-huh. we are going. And so, you know, they're asking and they're getting excited. So, I mean, we really talk about hand washing mm-hmm. all the time. So maybe just focusing on the actions that we can do to make things better. So, you know, we're washing our hands. That's how we're keeping ourselves safe and um, still getting, trying to get excited and letting them be excited about back to school while saying it is going to look different. You know, I'm having those conversations a little bit with my older daughter about, I know you're excited to see your friends and that's great. um, But also, be prepared that we might be also coming back home <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and well, just think- telling her what that it's develop you know, developmentally appropriate conversations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, we do that with ourselves too. Like we prepare as much as we can and whatever's in our control and, you know, wash hands to be safe. But then there is a lot of it that we don't know what's going to happen. So we just kind of, you know, we kind of get ourselves as ready as possible. So that's really great. I think that's a really good point. We have to kind of keep it more towards a positive tone because the last thing you want is to associate negativity with going back to school because then that's a whole other hurdle that you'd have to fight. So you don't want to do that. Yeah. Um, well, Adele, thank you so much. I was just wondering, were there any other resources or any, I know you talked about the CDSS website and there's some great teacher resources. Are there anything, uh, other things that you'd like to kind of recommend for parents or for teachers to look at? Parents and teachers, if wherever you're located, reach out to your local Down Syndrome Association. I know where we are in Halton, the Halton Down Syndrome Association, they have some wonderful videos and links posted on their site. Um, In thinking ahead, if there's, you know, sometimes you'll have parents that are involved who do like to come out and speak to classrooms, Mm -hmm. if that's not something you want to do. Um, I know I go out with my friend, Emily, who's about the same age as me, a self-advocate, and we go and speak, you know, she's involved with Special Olympics. We go into schools and and speak together. And you can find, um, you know, if you can find an individual with Down syndrome Mm -hmm. who will be willing to come and talk to a school or they they are probably the best resource, right? Agreed, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Yeah. yeah, and I think you can find those connections if you're in, locally involved. So searching out your sort of neighborhood or community center. Well, there might not be a physical center, but association anyway is a great mm-hmm. plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and then so just to kind of go back to our intro, when can we expect your book to come out? I'm very excited about this. Oh, you are so <laughs> sweet. Thank you so much. I, I'm working very hard on, in, in my program and we're, we're going to be meeting agents and publishers in the new year. So okay. who knows, right. but I will well, definitely keep you posted. Yes, please do. Yeah. We'll definitely put a link to it as well on our show notes just to kind of keep an eye out for it for our parents and teachers. So. Thank you so much. Everyone I, I've ever met will know. I <laughs> <laughs> got it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, thank you so much, Adele, for taking the time to chat with us. I feel like this is such an important conversation, and I'm hoping for our parents and teachers that are listening, it'll ease their fears a little bit. You know, it'll kind of create a little bit of a community amongst parents that everyone's kind of thinking and feeling the same things, and hopefully, you know, it'll it'll all go smoothly. I'm sure there's going to be bumps in the road, as there are really at any time, yeah. but yeah. But we're all in this together, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You got it. Yeah. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next week on the Lowdown, a Down Syndrome podcast.
you know, I remember just a quick example, um, being a new SLP here and having quite a lot of success teaching this little adorable seven-year-old, um, who's now 22, um, <laughs> how to say the S sound. And she was doing beautifully with it. Um, she, she was uh, originally saying things instead of salad, she would say talad, right? So, um, so she would replace the S with a T or a D. Uh, but she was really getting it at our sessions. She was getting it in all sorts of word positions and um, being quite uh, frequently successful with it. But then I'd watch her walk to the elevator after our session and she would stand by the elevator with her mom and she'd be like, bye Dudan. <laughs> and I was like, ugh. <laughs> Yum. That was 30 seconds ago. You just called me Susan and now I'm Dudan again. The Lowdown, the Down Syndrome podcast is a production of Down Stone Research Foundation. Learn more at dsof.org and join the conversation at DSOF Canada on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. The Lowdown is hosted by Marla Foden and Hannah Mahmood and is produced by Glenn Hughes. The Lowdown theme music and George Dew was written and recorded by Rick Scott.